I, I do a segment with RDS every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I usually do it from here. I'll change the backgrounds or whatnot. Um, I've done stuff at TSN, but you know, now we've been doing a lot of Skype and Zoom and all yeah. of that. So I kind of made a little area for me there and that go. works out. So I like it. just this morning I was on the instigator and I had the same background and PD was laughing. He goes, is this your... I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Taking advantage of the time off reading a lot of books back there. Eh? Exactly. Reading nice. a lot of books. So, nice. but uh, where, where are you? I'm uh, not too far from you, actually. I'm in Hamilton. Okay. So we're right yeah. over the 40, 45 minutes. Not, not, no big deal. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking some time today. First thing I want to start off with is, you know, we're here to talk about the mental side of hockey. And when somebody tells you, you know, mental side of hockey, what's the first thing that comes to your head? Uh, maybe it's a, it's a bad way of looking at it, but I think of mental toughness. You know, you always say like, this is a mentally tough athlete, mentally tough individual. And I really, I think over time, people have found out there, there's really nothing about tough. It's about rec, uh, recognizing your, your strength and your weaknesses and how to work through them and, and how to, uh, to have a plan. And so I, I, I don't consider myself a, a tough guy, but some people were saying like, oh, he's mentally tough. Well, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it applies anymore, but that's the first thing I think about when you talk about the mental side of the game is, is the phrase mental toughness. Maybe. Yeah. Is there a time in your career, maybe early on in junior or before junior, where it really started to click in your mind how important the mental side of hockey was to being successful as a goalie? Um, I, looking back now, there were so many moments when I was a, a youth, a kid, a teenager that helped me build – uh, disability to to rely on the mental aspect of the game to stay focused to stay prepared to stay consistent um, I tell my kids all the time like it, it's great to feel the highs and to feel the low but the, the smaller those those roller coaster rides type things are the more you're staying on that consistent plane so I remember being a kid and I got this uh, this VHS tape about goaltending and about the style of goaltending. And there was a, also a cassette that came with it and you could listen to it. And they would not only talk about goaltending, but they would also do visualization drills just with the auditory senses. So you'd close your eyes, you'd listen to the tape and they would say, this is a guy come down the left wing and he's taking a slap shot. So you would hear skating and you would hear a guy shooting a puck and, and in your mind, you'd be picturing it and you'd be visualizing it. And I think that now looking back, I'm like, this was so good for my yeah. development because it wasn't just about being on the ice and skating. It was about other things. Uh, but I didn't know at the time that yeah. it was working on your, your mental uh, aspect of the game. It was just, it was fun for me. I love to close my <laughs> eyes, listen to a, a, a thinking it was Wayne Gretzky coming down the right. road. A shot, right? So, so that was that was some of the things I remember as a kid, but never realized I was doing them for a purpose. Those are some pretty, you know, intense mental exercises as a kid. Is that something you discovered on your own, or was there somebody that kind of nudged you in that direction to try it well, out? My parents gave me this gift, right? And it yeah. was like I said, a VHS tape about uh, uh, many different drills for goaltenders, technique for goaltenders. Uh, it was done up in, in Montreal. It was in French. And it was one of those things where I watched. Even at the end of the tape, what they would do is they had put like a camera in the net with probably a plexiglass in front of it. And they had somebody come in and take shots so, or somebody standing still in the slot and just taking shots. And I used to stand in front of my TV. <laughs> be like, oh, it's coming here. It's going to. After like five or six times, you know the – uh, where the shots are going. So you're, you're thinking you're pretty good. Uh, but it maybe it was a start to what maybe virtual reality training is and, you know, the 3D headsets and, and all of that stuff. Uh, but it was done just with a, a VHS tape and a VCR. Um, and I'm not saying that it was something that my parents said, hey, this is going to be really beneficial to you. It was just they came across it. It was a good gift. I enjoyed it. And uh, maybe, again, maybe accidentally was very beneficial to my career. 
Yeah, no, that, that's such a great point. It really highlights how training your mental game can have the same impact on your performance as training a physical game. And it's still relevant, you know, the past couple of months with the COVID lockdown and everything where people don't have the same access to gyms, they might be thinking, what can I do to still improve my game? There's still all these visualization techniques, all these relaxation techniques and strategies that pro athletes can do to make sure they're still, you know, improving day to day. Absolutely. I, I remember my, so our, our schooling system in Quebec is a little different. After grade 11, we get out of high school, we go to CJAP. So mm-hmm. it's a, you know, junior college type thing. And I was going to CJAP while playing um, juniors in the Quebec major junior hockey league. We weren't allowed to take a gym class per se. They just figured, Hey, we don't want you guys playing basketball or, or volleyball and get hurt or whatnot. So our gym class was this relaxation relaxation class. We would go in, and it was basically almost like a, a precursor to some yoga. It was stretching. It was, you know, laying on your mat and breathing exercises and all of this. And I used to think, man, what, what are we doing? And now I'm like, that's what professional athletes do these days. They learn to calm themselves down, to breathe, to listen and learn their bodies and uh, and how it all works. So um, again, accidentally, I benefited from doing these relaxation classes in, in, in junior college because of that. Yeah, yeah. And it obviously, it all paid off for you. Let's start off at the NHL draft a bit when yeah. you were drafted by the Sabres. It's one of the, I think drafts are one of the most tough times for professional athletes because it's totally out of your control. You can't control who picks you. You have real no say in the matter. It's all up to the GMs and coaches, right? Yes. So as a young kid, what's kind of just your, your thought process and emotion leading up to the draft and knowing that this is a situation where it's kind of out of your hands, what happens? Well, I had dealt with a draft um, not as big, but very similar in a way with the Quebec Major Junior draft a year before. Okay. So in 94, I just finished my midget year and I'm going to uh, in a junior draft, which is set up very similarly. It's in an arena you're sitting on the floor or in the, in the stands and the teams go up to the stage and they call your name and then you go and you put the jersey on. And I got drafted in the first round that year and I remember being extremely nervous, shaking, like a shake <laughs> took over me in that draft. Um, but I'm there with all my buddies and my friends and my family and it's very uh, intense. Now, a year later, you go to the NHL draft and having experienced a junior draft, so I got to maybe have that under my belt once, but also the NHL draft is, is, is much bigger, mm-hmm. but personally, it felt really simple because it, there wasn't all my buddies there. It wasn't like my family around. It was my mom, dad, my brother, my agent, a few teammates that I had played with or people that I knew, but you know, you don't know who the guy drafting, being drafted fifth overall is, seventh overall is. You don't know these players. You've heard of them, but you don't know them personally. Uh, And at the same time, you don't know the teams, you don't know the coaches, you don't know the scouts as well as maybe I knew the junior guys. So when I got drafted in the NHL, I was sitting in the stands really enjoying myself, talking to, you know, my mom and dad, my brother, and, you know, all of a sudden, you can sense that something is about to happen in our section. Cameras start coming over, people. And so I kind of looked over at my agent and he says, pretty sure this is you, kid. And, yeah. and, and, and I was very calm. It was, oh, great. Like, the NHL was so unattainable. It was such a dream that you're like, okay, I'm going to get drafted in the NHL. That's great. I'm pretty good. Juniors to me was, wow, I, I'm playing junior hockey and, and I'm going to play in my hometown. That's where I got drafted. That was a whole other level. Uh, maybe it was on backwards. Yeah. Uh, most people experience it in a different way, but that's really my experience and how it felt. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but you went back to junior for a bit after the draft, right? Yes, I did. And, and that's what most people do. Yeah. Um, co- hockey is obviously different than college, uh, than college basketball transitioning the NBA or college football transitioning the NFL. Um, you don't really declare for the draft in the NHL. You just, you're of age and then you're available to be drafted. Mm-hmm. Now you most likely go back to juniors or go back to playing college, uh, American college, or uh, maybe you go back to Europe. So I played two more seasons of junior hockey before transitioning to pro. And those two seasons really didn't go, the, the progression didn't continue up. I plateaued after my first year junior and even took a slight dip. 
Um, so it was hard for me to, to get back up in the on, on the upswing and um, it happened luckily, but uh, it, w- it was not easy. Mentally, did you feel any added pressure or, or anything along those lines being a first round draft pick and then playing junior hockey afterwards? Did you see, did you feel maybe a bit more of a target on your back? I didn't feel pressure, but I can tell you that my mental makeup definitely switched. Um, I was an excellent student in school. I had one, you know, student of the year uh, with my team in midget. And uh, at some point in my you know, junior team, my first year, then I got drafted and then school all of a sudden kind of took a back seat. And it was, you know, I, you're thinking I'm going to play in the NHL. I'm, I'm that good. Uh, so the mental side of it really took a hit uh, and maybe not for the better early on. And you are 17, 18 or 19 years old and you may not have all the tools to be able to, to, pull a stop, pull the chain and say, hey, stop, and then go back on the right path. I was lucky I had some great coaches, some great people around me. Uh, when I got to Rochester in the American League, I, I, I was lucky and fortunate to, to work with some, some great people again. Uh, but it took me a little while, and it took me until my second year pro to really be full up on the upswing and, and feeling fully confident that I was back on track. I felt like slightly off track at 18, slightly off more a little bit at 19, at 20 all of a sudden I'm playing pro hockey and it doesn't seem to be going the way I want it at all. Uh, but then um, I got a couple breaks uh, really in, in, in my favor and that allowed me to get another opportunity to uh to perform and i took that opportunity and did uh yeah. did the best of it i think that really highlights in sports nothing is you know a straight line up in your progression in your career there's there's ups and downs there's dips and valleys and everything and it's how you respond to those those dips or you know those lows is really what will determine how successful you are as an athlete because everyone's going to have those ups and downs right like you said and being at such a young age is probably a bit harder to deal with as well but you're able to bounce back and have obviously a very successful nhl career and everything and and my experience is is what i lived through Mm -hmm. and my advice may not work for anybody else um and i know that what really changed for me was late in my first year pro I was playing with Rochester, wasn't playing well, was not playing a ton either. And then they decided it'd be uh, beneficial for me to go play in the East Coast League. And for a guy that had already played NHL games at 18 and then had a pretty successful junior career, but then was playing the AHL and then had to be sent down to a lower professional league, um, it, it hit me pretty hard. And when I got to Charleston, South Carolina, I, I changed my makeup a little bit. I, I was not that I was feeling pressure in Rochester, but it was much more like hockey driven. Like, okay, what do I have to do? It's hockey, hockey, hockey. Mm-hmm. And I got to South Carolina and I remember I got there on a Wednesday, practiced Thursday morning, played tennis all afternoon Thursday. I <laughs> uh, went to dinner with a few of the teammates, relax. You know, the next day at the morning skate Friday, uh, went on a long walk Friday afternoon in, uh, in on the warm, you know, February uh, day. It wasn't super warm, but it was still better than Rochester, New York. So I uh, went on a long walk to get prepared for that night and played a great game that night, played a great game Saturday night. And then because of an injury to a goalie in Rochester on Saturday, I got called up to Rochester right away Sunday. So... Without that injury, maybe I don't get my shot back in Rochester that season. Maybe things go a different way. But there was an opportunity for me to come back to Rochester and play, play a lot and play well. And I had gotten that, that jolt of energy or maybe the change of, of, of program a little bit as to what my focus was going to be on. And I was going to be much more relaxed. I was going to be uh, easier going. And that worked. And then I got to Rochester, finished the season well, played an excellent second year in Rochester with the same attitude. That went into the NHL and, and so forth. So I really believe if I don't go down to South Carolina, I probably don't make that change. And if there's not an injury in Rochester, well, maybe that change that I made doesn't become beneficial in me turning into an NHL goaltender because I would never have gotten the opportunity. So there's a lot of pieces that need to come together, obviously, to make it to the NHL. But 
for my the better of me and the better of the person I am, I think that trip to uh, South Carolina was definitely beneficial. That really highlights to me again, when you think of a situation in sports, there's always a good and a bad side to it, a pessimistic and an optimistic look. And I'm sure maybe your first time going to the East Coast League, you might have a bit more pessimistic view of, you know, why am I getting sent down? Like, am I not yeah. the same goalie maybe? But thinking back, you know, obviously it was a positive outcome. And that's something I really try and preach to a lot of the younger kids that I coach or consult with. I tell them, you know, when you're given an event or something that happens in your life, you can either look at it positively or negatively. And nine times out of 10, positively is going to get you farther in your professional development than negatively. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and I, my mom always said, you know, things happen for a reason. And, and I always look at, okay, maybe I don't know what that reason is right now, but it is happening. I can't change it. I, I'm on a plane to South Carolina. I can't go to the cockpit and say, get me back to Rochester. I'm yeah. not doing it, right? It's not going to happen. So maybe I don't know what the reason is right now, but later in life or maybe in a week or two or a year or two, I'll know what that reason was. But only if I approach it with the right attitude and work really hard at it. And so I, I think there's a certain way of being able to handle situations. Um, not everybody's going to handle them the same, the same way. Uh, I've had situations where I remember my third year pro at the end of training camp, which I had a really, really good training camp with the Buffalo Sabres. They told me I was being sent down to Rochester again. And by that point now, I'm, I'm mad. I'm angry. And I'm not a person that, that showed the display of, of emotions like that. And I got into a little bit of a, uh, a fight of words with the GM and the coach at the time in Buffalo. And I said, I'm going to be coming back here <laughs> soon. You'll see. I'm sick of this. You guys are just doing it for money. I'm like yelling and screaming. And I'm like, I'm looking back, I'm like, what were you thinking? If my son came to me and said, I yelled at my GM and my coach, right. I'd be, are you crazy? Well, again, six games later, three weeks later, I got a call and I got called up to Buffalo. Now the point is, is I just made a fuss about it when I got sent down to Rochester. I better perform. I better come in here and take that opportunity. So, you know, some people – put themselves in a bad in a bad situation some people put themselves in a better situation but whatever opportunity you get in whatever situation you get into you know the the bottom line is you got to work hard and you got to you got to do the work and you yeah. and you got to perform and so i stayed the rest of the year in buffalo because i took advantage of uh, maybe my emotional outburst and uh, that worked out for me <laughs> when you got in the scuffle with the coach and the gm was that when lindy ruff was there Lindy was there. Dar oh, okay. Gear was there. We were actually in the trainer's room. That's a tough um, conversation to have. And yeah. And they're like, Marty, you're going to go back down to Rochester. And you had a fantastic year last year. And you look back, well, they had Dominic Hasek. They had Dwayne Rolison. So they had two veteran goaltenders. I was still a young kid. You know, there's a numbers game to be played. But for me, hockey was so pure. Mm -hmm. And it's about the game. And I had had a great training camp, probably the best training camp out of all the goalies not named Dominic Hasek. Yeah. And I'm like, I deserve that spot. And I was a little mad and angry about it, but you go, you work. And then I started the season 6-0 in Rochester, was really performing well. Um, and then they gave me a call. But if I start the season 1-4-1 and in Rochester, they're probably saying like, Look at Marty. He's, yeah. He acted like a fool out of here, and he's following it up with bad perform performances, right? So that was definitely the big thing. Yeah, yeah. I want to touch on a bit about you taking over from Hashik and getting that starting job. But before that, I want to touch quickly on your first call up to the Sabres back in what, 95 yeah. or 96? Obviously, yeah, 95, 96. the infamous call up, one of the youngest goaltenders in NHL history. You go up against Mario, Yager, Ron Francis, the stack team. I know you've told the story a bunch of times of how it happened leading up to the game. But what I'm really interested in is after the game, how did you maintain your confidence to pick yourself back up when the match doesn't really go your way? Well, I didn't have much time to think about it because we were playing the very next night at the uh, Memorial Auditorium in Buffalo against, uh, against Ottawa. So after the game in Pittsburgh, I didn't really have time to think about it so much. Uh, but I remember after the game against the Ottawa Senators, so I'm sitting in the locker room. We just lost the game 5-4, I believe. So I've not really had a, two good games. Uh, you know, I, the NHL was a 
of not one, but about 16,000 levels above the uh, juniors. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and you're playing against Mario Lemieux and all Jager and these guys and then playing the Ottawa Senators, which were not a good team at the time, but you, they're still NHL players and you're losing. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the locker room and I look around the locker room and everybody's hanging their gears in their stalls, right? They're all in, and I have my bag open in front of my stall. Basically, pack your bag, kid. You're you're out of here. And I look around, and there's maybe two or three guys in the whole team that have their bags in front of their stall. So I'm sitting in my stall. I'm like, ah, that's it. I blew it. I blew my opportunity. I blew my chance. And I'm starting to get emotional and upset a little bit about it, but I keep it inside. And uh, then Rip Simonic, our equipment manager, comes by. He goes, Marty, hurry up, will you? Like, we don't have all you know night, and we got to get going. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm taking my gear home, obviously. Like, I'm being sent back down. I'm going to be going home tomorrow. He goes, you're not going anywhere. We got to practice tomorrow at the practice rink, and you don't have two sets of gear. Everybody here and here has two sets of gear. They have a practice gear at the practice rink and a game gear here. But we got to get your equipment out into the truck and to the practice rink so we can hang it and dry it. So get yourself going. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm still staying here. Like, I, I'm still in the NHL, right? I didn't, I didn't totally blew it. Uh, but that's easy for your mind to go right to the negative. You lost two games. It's not going well. And just because your bag is open in front of you doesn't mean you'll never make it back to the NHL. At the time, that's what my head was thinking. Uh, but somebody says, no, we just got to get your gear yeah. to the practice ring. So I guess – and those moments, funny, it's why wow, it's 25 years later almost. Uh, you know, I it still are vivid in my mind that they happen and, and why they happen and what I was thinking, which, uh, which makes it pretty cool. <laughs> Being the, young, the younger kid in the dressing room, did you find yourself a bit more timid being around all these NHL pros and the coach and the GM and everything? Or were you able to still be yourself to a certain degree? I was so naive and I... I always kind of was myself. I, I don't know if I didn't realize that I was playing alongside of uh, Charlie Huddy and Pat Lafontaine and Hasek and, and all these great players, right? And obviously, for me, it was just a hockey team. It was just a, a group of guys. Mm -hmm. So funny story, a few weeks later, we travel out West Canada. We play in Winnipeg, and we have a rookie dinner in Winnipeg. And... I didn't have a, a contract signed with the, uh, with the Sabres. I was on a professional tryout. I still hadn't signed my, my, uh, my entry-level contract. And we were negotiating. And so we're negotiating. And the way my contract was in the three years is my salary in the NHL went up. But my salary in the American League was going to go down. So, you know, I asked him, like, well, why is my salary in the American League going down? And the Sabres says, well, we don't expect you'll spend much time in the American League anyway. So it doesn't really matter. So I'm like, oh, pretty good. So we have our team dinner that night, and we're sitting, and the guys are like, so Marty, how's the contract negotiation? Because they wanted to know if I had signed, so I was going to have to chip into the dinner if I had signed. But if it was just on a tryout, they weren't going to make me pay. So I said, it's getting close. We're not there yet. But, uh, you know, I think, I think it's going to be great. I, I, my salary in the NHL is going to keep going up, which is great. And they told me it didn't matter if my salary in the American League was going to go down because I wasn't going to be in the AHL all that long anyway. The whole place erupted in a laughter. Like, they're like, <laughs> who says those type of things? Like, yeah. I was just a young kid. And I remember we had guys like Dave Hannon who had been around the league for, for a long time. He was an older guy. We had Donald Odette that was there. He was making fun of me because he's like, Marty, you can't say that stuff. And I'm like, yeah. what? Like, that's what they told me. And they're like, yeah, we have a bunch of guys here that have worked their whole life to make it to the NHL. You're 18 years old and you're, you're given that opportunity. I, I don't know that you want to go out and, and broadcast to the world that the team says, eh, don't worry, you won't be in the NHL all that right. long. So I was naive. I was just 18 and, and I was enjoying my time, right? Yeah. I, I, it was short time. It was only three weeks. But I, I did learn a lot. And, you know, Rob Ray still tells the story. Every, every time he has a chance, he goes, oh, Marty, that time you said your salary in the AHL was yeah. going down because you weren't going to be there long. And he laughs and laughs because <laughs> I, I don't know. I was just being me.
I think there's something to say though, about you being, you helped you stay somewhat relaxed. I mean, you might not have been totally hundred percent relaxed in those NHL games, but you being yourself allowed you to maybe adapt to the situations better. And that's another thing yeah. I always preach to a lot of the, the younger kids is don't let, you know, your thoughts about what other people think of you stop you from being who you are. Just be who you are in the dressing room. If you're quiet, be quiet. If you're the leader, be the leader, but be who you are. Cause that's where you'll find the most success. Yeah, be respectful. That's the number one thing because there is a, a certain, uh, uh, you know, a group or a leadership group and there's people that have been around a longer time. Perfect example is I, I showed up for breakfast the one morning on the road that first year. I think we were in Calgary and I, I got downstairs and I was wearing a, um, a team issued like a track pants and track jacket from my junior team. So I got down the elevator and I walked through the lobby to go to breakfast and Pat LaFontaine was on his way out and he's wearing dress pants, dress shoes, button down shirt, a jacket. He looked at me, he goes, where do you think you're going? I'm like, I'm just going for breakfast. He goes, Hey, there's a dress code. Go back upstairs, put some clothes on, come back down when you're looking professional. This is not juniors. And, uh, and I remember being like, Yes, Mr. Lafontaine, like almost like uh, I'm, I'm yeah. going. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and, and I did. And, and listen, you're going to make mistakes as a young man. Um, maybe you don't know the situation. You, you go into business world and you don't know how things always work and you're going to make mistakes. But if you're respectful and you take ownership of those mistakes and you move forward from them and you're willing to listen and learn, uh, people will recognize that. I remember Patty telling me, hey, kid, go back upstairs, get changed. And I didn't say like, I'm just going to get a muffin. Like, come on, I'll go back after. I, I didn't take another step forward. I went right back to the elevator, went up, got changed. And then I went reset. And yeah. then I went back downstairs and now I was like, okay, now I'm the NHL player that they expect me to be. I'm not just this junior kid that's walking around in flip flops and, uh, and, and track suit. Right. Yeah, and Pat LaFontaine is probably one of the last people you want mad at you as well on that team. Yeah, but he was really good about yes. it. He, he yeah. said, hey, kid, go exactly. back upstairs. Uh, you know, some other guys may have been like, who do you think you are? What are you doing? And this, you know, so there's a, a level of respect also yeah. from a veteran side or a mentorship side to be able to help the young uh, up-and-comer guy that maybe doesn't know much about it and, and needs to learn. Yeah. Again, you know, Hashik was the goalie there for a couple of years when you were getting yeah. called up, back up and whatnot. And then you eventually had the opportunity to take over for him and him being one of the most legendary NHL goalies of all time. I got to ask you a bit about your mindset and walk me through that. The first couple of weeks being named the starting goaltender in Buffalo and knowing that those are some pretty big pads to fill. Yeah. I remember I did an interview maybe the summer before because Hashik had, um, uh, announced that he was going to retire. So, and then he suffered an injury that year. But when he announced that he retired, um, they came to me and they said, Hey, what do you think? Like Dom is going to retire. And I said, when Dom retires, there's like, they said something to the effect that, uh, how about, how is it going to be to fill his shoes? And I remember saying when Dom retires, he leaves with his shoes. There's nobody that can fill those shoes and nobody should try to fill those shoes. He's going to grab his shoes, his skates, his equipment, and He's gone, right? So then the 99-2000 season, he had injuries, so he decided to come back for one more year, which ended up turning into, you know, four or five more because he went to Detroit, went to Ottawa, went back to Detroit. It was – it never ended, right? He retired like two or three times and returned every yeah. time. Uh, but I – again, maybe being naive – uh, I was like, okay, I'm good. You know, like Ashek was, was him and he was, he was the best goaltender in my opinion to ever play the game or the most dominant to ever play the game. But I can be me. I can play the game. And maybe looking back now, my first season of, as a starter, I played 72 games that year. Out of 82, I played 72 games. That's crazy. That you don't see that anymore. You don't see that anybody no, do that today. It, no. It was maybe more popular back in the days because Patrick and Marty Brodeur and Curtis Joseph and Eddie Belfort and those guys used to play 65, 70, 75 games sometimes. Uh, but a, you know, 24 uh, – no, at the time I was not 24. Yeah, I was 24 years old. So we're talking 2001. I'm 24 years old. You don't see a lot of 24-year-olds – playing 72 games. Um, so I just played. I, I didn't worry about, you know, what, what, was, what would Ashok do in this situation? Or 
how is Dominic doing in Detroit or, or what is going on? I just played, I just played the game and, uh, um, you know, focus on myself and focus on our team. Maybe we had some distractions that got my focus away from being overwhelmed with the position because we went through then the next year we went through some bankruptcy issues and players being dealt and we had a young team. So all of us young guys were in the same boat. We, we really didn't know much. We just played the game. We went on the road. We would literally bring like a, uh, a Nintendo 64 or the early stage of PlayStation and, and be playing video games in the hotel room. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we didn't really think about uh, the pressure of the game. We were just kids and we all were living the same experiences. So maybe that was good for that, that we were able to just uh, not feel the heat and the spotlight so much on us. I'm kind of interested. Is there a difference in your mentality approaching the game being a starter versus a backup? Because from an outside perspective, and I'll preface this by saying I'm a pretty big Leafs fan. So this year there was much noise made about, you know, Michael Hutchinson's play and then they had Cascasuo go in and then they go trade for Jack Campbell. It seems like there's a lot of pressure from the media on backup goalies and almost when a backup goalie <laughs> loses, there tends to be a bit more blame put on them than maybe the starting goalie or, or the team in general. Well, you for you, it, uh, it's it's very tough. Yeah, um, I've I've lived both, right? I've lived a starter, I've lived a backup. My last few years were really much more as a backup goalie, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that role. To be honest with you, I, I loved it. But you have to have the right mindset for it, um, and you have to have the right. Um, and I I, I want to say the right coaches, but it, you have to have the right support system. Um, I played my last few years with John Tortorello is very demanding, very, very demanding, but I love that. I love a guy that's very demanding, but I also had a great goalie coach in Benny Allaire. That was the buffer between. So if, you know, I remember my first year in, in New York, my first game, we played in Toronto and won a game two one and Torts are like, way to go Marty. That's the way I'm talking about. And then a week later, he gives me a start at home against Atlanta. We lost six, four. And then next day in the video, He's showing the goals and he goes, guys, we played it perfectly. Marty, you need to make a save here. And he's looking at me sideways. And then he's yeah. like, Marty, you need to make a save here. And then he gets up in front of the whole team. He says, listen, I need more. You, you want to play, but you need to perform to play. And when you play, when you perform, you're going to play. And if you play, you're probably going to perform. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. But I need to feel confidence in your play. And as the backup goalie, you're thinking, okay, well, when's my next start? And, you know, we're October 21st. Am I not going to get a start until November 10th, November 15th? Like, especially playing with a guy like Henrik Lundqvist. Yeah. So you have to have your coach understand your position, which Torts did, and he would give me regular starts. And maybe that was the goalie coach, Benny Allaire, that was like, hey, we need to get Marty in here. We need to give Henrik a break there and plan it out. But it, there's a very much of a different approach when you're a backup and when you're a starter, you know, a starter, you have to be on uh, almost all the time. A backup, you can't. Because if you're on all the time, but you never play, then you start, like, it starts wearing on you. Yeah, you start so, to burn out. Start to burn out. Like, you're, you're turning it on, but for nothing, right? There's, there's nothing that's cooking, but your <laughs> oven is always on. Like, it's just like, wait, there's a purpose, and it's not doing what the purpose is supposed to be. So. Benny Allaire really had a plan for me when I was the backup is he'd say, okay, look, uh, we're Monday. We have games Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. You're probably going to get one of the weekend games, like either Friday or Saturday night. So let's build our plan. Monday, I want you to start, you know, building the foundation. Tuesday, take a step up. By the time we get to Thursday and Friday, you're hitting your peak. Like we're reaching your peak mentally, physically, technically. He used to always refer to those three columns. There's men, uh, mental, technical, physical. So we're reaching your peak in all three columns. And then when you play, things will go well. So his approach with me was obviously different than the approach with Lundqvist. The approach with Lundqvist was, let's be on top today. Let's be on top tomorrow. Let's be on top Thursday. And then Friday, you're not playing let the air out, right? right. And then right. you're back in the net Saturday, let's be on top. So the approach is completely different 
when you're talking about a starting goalie and a, and, yeah. and a backup goal. When you talked though about, you know, how you had Benny Allaire as kind of the buffer and a little bit about the makeup of behind the scenes of a hockey team really kind of speaks to me the cliche of hockey's not played on paper. You see it all the time where the best team on paper doesn't always win. It's, it's yeah. about the coaches and how they get along with the players, the, rela- the relationships you have in the locker room, that really determines the team's success. And it really kind of sounds like, at least I know in all your situations, you had good team chemistry and everything, but specifically your situation with the Rangers that that really allowed you to to excel when you got called upon. I know you had some of your best stats as a goalie goes against average and save percentage wise in those situations as well. Yeah. And, and that's why hockey teams now uh, are starting to grow their staff where you have a head coach, a couple of assistant coach, a skills and development coach, a goalie coach. There's going to be a skating coach that's going to come in once in a while. You've got a rehab coach. You have a team of, uh, athletic trainers and, and sports science. You have a, a team of equipment manager. Mm-hmm. One may be more focusing on skates and one is more focusing on other things. And so they're building their teams because they definitely realize that um, the, the, the interaction inside the locker room, inside that group uh, is as important as the work that's happening on the ice on game day. And so that that is definitely... Uh, something that the NHL has recognized. I think professional football has recognized that years ago because you'll have your linesman coach, your defensive linesman coach, your linebacker coach, your wide receiver coach, and and everybody's got to work together within being able to be individual. And for years, it was only goalie coach was like taking care of the goalies and, and the coach was at all the other players. Well, one or two coaches for 20 players, that's a lot. So to be able to break it up in small groups and then get together as a big group after uh, is definitely more helpful. I really want to get your opinion on something. I think it's such a huge issue for a lot of professional athletes, but stepping away from the game. I'm kind of curious when you retired, what was the timeline between you and your head saying you were ready to step away and then for it to actually happen? Well, I mean, if you don't know that by now, you probably uh, should know that I, I'm I'm different than everybody else in the way that I think and approach sometimes. Um, and my last year in New York, I went to training camp, and and really in the back of my mind, I was thinking this this probably is going to be my last season. It's my last year of my contract. Um, you know, I was 36 years old. Um, so I'm thinking it is probably getting towards the end. I have four kids, you know, they're in school and we keep moving them around. So I got to start thinking about the after career. Uh, but I, I still had that it, during the summertime anyway. I still had like, I can't wait to get to training camp and, and I'm going to have fun. And I got, got to training camp and it just didn't fit right. It didn't feel right inside of me. I, I love the game of hockey. Uh, and I and I love watching on TV and I love practicing and, and all of that, but but it just didn't fit all the pieces the way that it used to fit in the past. And maybe it was the year before where we had just a half a season in 2012, 2013, mm-hmm. where we only played 48 games, and I think I played five that year. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I mean, if Torts came to me right now and said, Marty, you're going to play tomorrow, I, I probably would say, I can't. I mean, I'm not, I, I didn't feel like that same hunger to play and that same desire to go and play. So I started the year in New York in 13, 14 and, you know, training camp was okay. I, I mean, I was kind of forcing it, right. Forcing it, forcing it, forcing it. And then the season starts. And again, like, I'm like, okay, like we went on this long West coast road trip. Uh, we had training camp in, in Calgary and Banff, and it was like we were on the road a lot. So that maybe didn't help the the same situation. But, you know, and, and then I played the game. I, I came into the game in San Jose, did not play well. Had a start in St. Louis a few days later, did not go well. And I remember right after that that St. Louis game, I called home, I called my dad, and I said, I think I'm done. I really, I, I think I'm done. And he goes, well, he goes, you would know. Um, I always said from when you guys were a kid, most important part of the game is having fun and being able to enjoy it. So think about it. So I asked the team to get a few days to be able to go home and, and, and think about it all. But my mind was pretty much set. Um, so I went home for a couple of days. And I remember my parents were there, talked to the family. 
And I said, look, I'm going to go back. I've had 48 hours to take a breather here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to practice and I'll see. I'll know in practice what it's like. And I went to practice and after practice, I had a meeting with the coach and the GM and I said, guys, I'm, I, I, I'm done. I, I, I really believe I'm done. So I'm going to go home. And, uh, you know, that was on Monday. And by Wednesday, you'll have my answer. Um, at that time now, they had to start making transactions. So they're like, okay, well, we'll put you through uh, waivers to send you down because we have to call somebody up and we, life has to continue here, but give us your answer in a couple of days. And, uh, and I called him, I said, I'm retiring. And then I was sitting at home in Buffalo and I remember like it's yesterday, I'm sitting on the couch there's a Sabres game on TV, and it's Buffalo against Vancouver. So it's Roberto Luongo at one end and Ryan Miller at the other end at the time. And I remember thinking, man, like, I can't wait to see this matchup, but I, there's no way I would want to be in these guys' <laughs> shoes. Like, these, there's no way. I love the game way too much yeah. to hate the game. I was starting to hate the game. I, I didn't – the pieces didn't fit. It, it didn't feel right. I was starting to hate the game, and I love the game of hockey. So I need to do something else. I need to do something else in the game, but playing is just not what I can do anymore. Um, and that was, that was my decision, and I never, never look back. My kids sometimes will say, Dad, get back in shape and get back in there. I'm like, right. no, don't no. want to do it. No chance now. No chance, you know. And it's not because I haven't played in six years or whatnot. It's just no way. I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to do that anymore. One of the most important takeaways I took from that is that you didn't wait until the end of the season to make that decision. When you knew it was ready, you made that instance. And you know, it's not, you're not so much being selfish in that regard, but you're just doing what's best for you. And you didn't want yourself to hate the game even more. You recognize this was the time. It's not worth going through the whole season again and make maybe you hating it even more. This was the time and this is what I'm going to call it. I think that's a really good lesson for people is, is to know when it's time and, and, and don't worry about what other people think because as long as you're happy, Everybody, I think, will understand that. I probably would not be talking to you today and probably would not be working as an analyst and, and uh, doing some on-ice goalie instruction and, and all of that if I play out the year because I would have been so um, mentally in a bad place with the game of hockey if I let it wait four, five, six months before ultimately taking the same decisions that I could have taken in October or November. Now, I understand at some time that the decision is, is, is hard to make, or maybe you don't have the options. So you have to push through, and there's a way maybe if I, if I had to have pushed through that year, I would have gotten help. I would have maybe had a sports psychologist uh, help me navigate through those waters. Uh, but I had the option, and really I felt that it was the, the, the best thing to do and to move into something else a new challenge in life. And, uh, and, and I've never looked back one minute. Awesome to hear a little game. I like to play in the podcast here before you wrap up. I have a collection of sports psychology quotes from different sports. Um, I'll let you pick a number between one and 17 and I'll okay. read you the quote and then just reflect on the quote a bit. Tell me what it means to you in your career. Okay. I am going to pick 11, 11. This is, um, this is a good one. This is from Venus Williams legendary okay. tennis player of course she said uh sports are mostly mental you win or lose the match before you even go out there um there is a lot of truth to it uh but she also talks about individual sports so for her when she goes out on the court uh you know she's one-on-one -on -one, and if mentally she is not there at all um maybe her physical ability will help her overcome the match but to be able to be at the highest level and achieve our full potential is no doubt that, especially in individual sports, she has to be mentally as sharp as possible. In a team sport, um, sometimes not everybody has their best game. You cannot have 82 perfect game in a, in a hockey season. It's impossible. It can't sustain that. But you also have to understand that you know, the, the, the mental aspect will fluctuate, the, the technical and the physical aspect will fluctuate, but you can help one another. Um, so again, when we go back to the three pillars yeah. of, of, uh, of the game that Benny Eller was talking about, so you have the mental pillar, the physical pillar, and the technical pillar. Well, if your mental game drops, 
automatically it drops the other two pillars. It, it just, even if you're working so hard on your technical part of the game, but your mental drops, that's going to drop the technical pillar. And if your physical drops, it's going to drop your mental pillar. So you always have to work on all three of them to be able to keep all three up. If one drops, if you're injured and you can't perform at the top level that you want, it drops your technical and it's going to drop your mental because you may be frustrated. You may uh, not have the same focus. So that's the big thing. And yes, I would say that the mental aspect of, of sports as Venus Williams was, uh, Serena, right? Is it Venus? Venus. 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 As Venus Williams was saying, um, is probably the one that before the game has the biggest impact on how the result is going to happen. Your preparation, the team you're playing against, uh, who are the top players on the team, your penalty kill situation, your power play situation, uh, what your systems you're going to play, all of that mental work that you do before the game, yes, has a tremendous impact on the game. But as the game is playing, I think that everything else overtakes and it fluctuates and maybe the first period is very physical, demanding, and you need to have your physical top ability. Maybe the second period is more of an X's and O's type of game and it's a chess match and that's the technical aspect that takes over. Um, so I think that in a match, there's a lot of different things that can change, but before the match, uh, mental is probably the, the most important one. Some goalies that I know, they, they almost approach their game like it's a solo sport, like one-on-one, -on -one, like they pit themselves versus the goal on the opposite side of the, on the rink. And I know that you say, you know, that everyone's individual and different things work for different people. But what are your kind of thoughts on that of like a goalie really focusing on it's them versus the other goalie and not team versus team? No, I never really did that. And listen, if I played against Patrick Waugh when he was in Colorado, yeah, there was a little bit of a whoo hee hee with <laughs> Patrick Waugh. Like, yeah. But I never saw it as I'm going to do better than you at the other end or I need to beat you at the other end. Um, listen, I, I always focus on a much broader um, uh, concept. And, you know, you play a team, you have your players. I used to go through the lineup. Mm -hmm. and try to, to remember tendencies and, and what the last game looked like. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to keep a, a journal of the games, and we played you know, the town over and who were their best players and, and what they tried to do in this game and how the game went. And so I, I, I was maybe developed into looking at through a much broader mm -hmm. uh, spectrum than just trying to, to use the matchup as a uh, – as as an element of uh, uh, of maybe preparation, uh, and uh, and maybe that was you know again maybe that was my way of looking at it. I don't know. I I've never really talked about that with other goalies, but yeah. I would think that there's some goalies that look at it and they say it's you against me, my friend. Like right. we're 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 going we're going to do this, and they really won't take a shot on each other, won't be even skating in the same vicinity of one another, but there's got to be some goalies that look at it that way. Yeah, it really does highlight how the whole topic of sports psychology, there's foundations to sports psychology, but how it's applied can vary person to person. And that's why there's sports psychologists and that's why there's hockey coaches and all this all these things to guide the players in the right direction. Yeah, and, and coaches nowadays in college and juniors and the pros, um, I almost feel like they need their psychology degree to be able to handle 25 different uh, players that come from many different places in the world that have different upbringings and different traditions and cultures. And, and you have to understand all of that to be able to give that player the best tools. Um, so, yes, yeah, sports psychologists are, are huge. Um, you know, I, I, I used a sports psychologist many, many, many times in my career. I've used a regular therapist uh, or psychologist uh, many times in my life and still do uh, because there is definitely um, a lot to take in and a lot to evaluate to be able to have all the, uh, um, the tools to be able to be successful. Mm -hmm. Last thing here before we wrap up, I have a couple rapid fire questions for you. Sure. Um, 
we were in quarantine for quite a while. Things are starting to open up now, but while we were locked down, was there anything you were binge watching while you were home? And you can't say old Sabres games because I know you might have dipped into a couple of those. We did do some Sabres classic and I watched them, but I'll be honest with you, I watched so much uh, TV and, uh, and TV shows that I, I forget which one I've watched. <laughs> you know, it all started with the crazy Tiger King and yeah. you know, all of that. And, but I'm like, that was so long ago. I know. Um, one thing that I love doing, and this is my routine at night, and, and I'm, I'm a geek and a dork for that, but I get into bed, you know, it's 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, whatever, and then I want to chill, so I get on my phone, you know, go on social media, check Twitter, whatever, and then I have the TV on, and I watch Friends. Friends is on every That's, night here it's a classic. in the U.S., and I watch, and I probably have watched more friends in the last three months than I have all my life, but uh, um, so that's one thing that I've been, if we can say binge watching, yeah. Uh, but I've I've watched so many different either documentaries, uh, fiction, uh, TV, drama, comedy. I, I've watched so many of them, so I can't really pinpoint one of them. Mm-hmm. Being um, from from Quebec and now living most of your life now in the U.S., is there one French French Canadian food that you miss that you wish you can get every now and then? Oh, there's a lot that I miss, but I make it here if I really miss it. So obviously poutine is one that whenever I'm across the border and, you know, I stop, I'm always looking for a good old poutine. But here, I mean, I get the cheese, I get the brown gravy, I go to five guys and get the the, 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 the fries that are really good and I make it. My kids love it. Um, you know, there's, there's a few different things that uh, I miss food wise, but I grew up in Quebec City, so I miss going to some of those little cafes and restaurants and little things like that, that that's so unique to Quebec City. So that, that is one thing that I miss, yes. Yeah. You've played on a lot of NHL teams with a lot of really great jerseys. Are there a couple of jerseys that stick out that you really like to wear or looking Ooh. back on you really like they look like? The Rangers white jersey is is so cool, and it says it's timeless, uh, Rangers yeah. across. It's it's timeless, right? It's so. And unfortunately, that I hate whites on the road. <laughs> I can't tell you this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Whites is at home, people. Right. It should be at home. Yeah. So the New York Rangers white jersey at home at MSG, like, is there more iconic? Yeah, the Leafs at home in their whites, or the Montreal Canadiens at home in their whites. But it's the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's iconic whites at home. So I think the New York Rangers white jersey was was one of my favorite. I thought it really, really was cool. Uh, and and for somehow, <laughs> not a popular opinion, but I love the red jerseys, the third jersey we used to wear um, in the late 90s, early 2000s when the Sabres had the black, silver, and red and white. Okay. So it was just red. It had a big black circle with two mm-hmm. swords going through. It said Buffalo on the bottom of the shirt. Yeah. Um, I, and the, the goat head logos on the shoulders. I love that red jersey. It just, we were used to white and black, white and black, and all of a sudden we came out with red, and it was really cool to have the red jerseys in Buffalo. So I really liked that one as well. Um, so those are probably the two jerseys that I, I loved uh, in the teams that I played. My second year in Philly, they came out with the orange jersey, that re- the replica from the 70s yeah. of the Flyers. Um, I liked that, but I didn't play long enough with it to to really like feel like yes i love that jersey but the white rangers and the red sabers were were two of my favorite that um that black sabers jersey with the buffalo on the front that was one of the first jerseys that i wore playing house league hockey so even even as a Leafs fan i kind of have a a special place in the heart for that jersey that was a popular jersey in the youth levels you'd go to a tournament and you'd you'd see seven teams that had that that uh (laughs) that template of Jersey with a different logo on the front. It was a very popular Jersey. You played against and with a lot of great players, but give me a couple of names for guys that people may not assume that, you know, are one of the greatest of all times that you maybe really gave you trouble as a goalie. Someone that maybe always had your number. The worst guy was Danny Breer for me. Uh, And we played midget against each other, juniors against each other, American league against each other, NHL against each other. And he scored literally every single game. And not just a one goal. It was like two, three goals a game. Just just had my number. Could never stop him. And then we played in Arizona one game, one year. And he's playing for the, uh, you know, uh, Phoenix Coyotes. And I'm with Buffalo. 
and we beat them one nothing. And I swear, Danny had about five posts. He missed a wide open net in the dying seconds of the game. Um, but and then I think it was like three weeks later he was traded to Buffalo. And I said, I finally <laughs> finally figured you out. And then you're coming to play with us, right? And, uh, in practice, I could never stop him. So he was the worst by far. Yeah. That. You know, although if you look at the stats and who gave me the hardest time, he's not going to factor in there because we didn't play against each other all that much in the NHL because he was in the Western Conference, I was in the East, and then we played together for a few years. But um, he was definitely the hardest for me at all levels to ever stop. Now, Yarmir Yager, he was... It's hard to find a better he, one than that. From my first game in the NHL, he scored two goals that game. He was with Pittsburgh. I never played well against Pittsburgh. <laughs> There's another, maybe for a different uh, time, but, you know, teams and buildings that you never seem to do well in yeah. and teams and buildings that you never seem to do bad against. Like, it's just, there's a certain feelings that sometimes you see the jersey and it triggers success or it triggers eh, not so much. And Yager always triggered that, and eh, this is going to be a tough one tonight. <laughs> so uh, it didn't matter if it was with Pittsburgh, Washington, the Rangers. He uh, always found a way. For sure, for sure. Last question here. Is there one person, current or, or, or former player, that you think would be a good guest in the podcast? Someone that you think has a really strong mental game that you look up to? Wow, there is a lot of them. Um, you know, I think Ryan Miller was a very, very... Mm -hmm. Um, methodical, uh, mental, his approach is visualization before the game. He'd be on the bench with his stick and he'd do some visualization exercise. Uh, his routine was second to none. I think Millsy was one that, uh, uh, that was pretty good. Now, uh, Henrik Lundqvist was fantastic and he still is and he has one of the most intense, and when I say intense, is his desire to win. That being with him, I almost had to like bring him down a little bit. Hey, listen, let's, let's loosen you up a little bit on the way yeah. you're wounded. And, yeah. and, uh, and so for him, that was completely different. Uh, and one that's very, very impressive. And I saw a video on it on YouTube about the, the Washington Capitals released a couple of years back or three years back, a video about Brayden Holby mm -hmm. and his routine and his game day routine. And I kid you not, just watching the video, I was exhausted. I was mentally yeah. exhausted from everything that he does and his visualization and his juggling and his stretching and his this and his that. Like, I almost find it that it was too much. Like, there was too much. And, and I don't know now. I'd have to ask him, you know, when this resumes or whatnot, as he, if he's brought it back down to a more manageable um, you know, uh, a pregame routine because I felt like that was too much and, and you can become prisoner of that routine a little bit. So um, I'd have to know if he made some changes or if he's still that way, if he's still that way, man, more power to him because it was exhausting just to watch. For sure. For sure. No. Anyways, man, I, I really appreciate you taking some time today. Again, growing up as a Leafs fan, I can't say that I was your number one fan. I don't know how many times you robbed <laughs> Sundin or McGillany or Roberts or whoever it was, but um, I really, I really appreciate you taking some time today and diving into a bit about the mental side of hockey. And last thing I'll say is, you know, coronavirus is, is almost wrapped up, hopefully, but I just have, you know, well wishes for you, your friends and your family that everybody stays safe and healthy during this time. Same to you. And thanks for approaching a, a subject that very rarely is, is approach, you know, people like to talk about goals and games and gold medals and rings and all of that. But I do believe that the mental side of, of sports uh, and really the mental side of anything, you can be an entrepreneur, you can be a, a fortune 500 uh, business person or, or a professional athlete. There's a lot that comes into play. So I think that's very important. Yeah. And, and the last thing I'll say is with a lot of the athletes, I always, I always kind of give a little caveat that, you know, the mental side of sports doesn't just apply to sports. It applies to life in general. The life lessons you learn as a professional athlete, especially as a goalie, they apply to your life in general, whether it's confidence, dealing with adversity, teamwork, respect, whatever it may be. Yeah, my kids are sick of me telling them life lessons <laughs> about the things I've learned. But hey, hopefully, and things happen for a reason. Maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, they'll be like, oh, I totally get what dad was go. talking about. Oh, there you so, go. A little bit of hindsight oh, there. Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Marty, it's been an hour and, and time flies when you're having fun. So again, appreciate you taking some time and, and we'll chat again soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Take care, man. Yep.